Uh, this is Wes Lyon, President and CEO of McGill and Lyon Dental Advisors. On today's podcast, you're going to learn about the business side of dentistry and orthodontics and a little bit more about what's going on in the private equity DSO world and what you can do to make sure your practice is successful moving forward. Orthomarketing.com, 360 degree digital marketing solutions for your practice. Hey, well, hello, everybody out in podcast land. Guess what? It's Dean Steinman from Ortho Marketing, and we are back with another podcast for you. <laughs> so um, it is now middle of September 2023. Football season it just started, and as you guys know, as a Jet fan, my season's almost already over, so <laughs> please keep throwing that sympathy to me. But you know, with that said, and get that stuff out of the way, I'm very excited for a very special new guest that we have with us today. Um, today, I have uh, Wes Lyon. Wes is the president and CEO of McGill and Lyon Dental Advisors. Wes, welcome, man. How are you doing today? Oh, thank you. I'm doing great. Other than my football season's over too, but uh, <laughs> hey, I guess it's on to bigger things in the fall now. <laughs> yeah, ex- exactly. Isn't it crazy, man? We You look forward for nine, 10 months and within a week, it pulls right out from under you. Crazy. Absolutely. You get all the hype and then, uh, you know, finally you see what they're worth and uh-oh. <laughs> exactly. Reality sets in. And so, um, Wes, tell us your story. Who is Wes Lyon? Give us a little background about you and, and, um, and what you do. Absolutely. Well, I started kind of working for a, a private equity back group in the financial advisory space. And really, I was doing consulting. So we're taking small financial advisory businesses and trying to make them more profitable. And from there, I bounced around a little bit, went into institutional asset management, decided I didn't really like the finance world. And about the same time, John McGill, the original founder, called me and, you know, the rest is really history. I think it was a great match. What we do is I've always been a CPA. I did do a stint in public accounting. It didn't last very long, didn't like it. But what we really do is, you know, a mix of helping people achieve their financial goals, kind of fix their practices, get the overhead in line and really help them grow businesses from, you know, less, I think not in your side, we're not marketers, we're more of kind of executors on, hey, here's the decisions you need to make. So really, it was a great match. Um, The thing I didn't know at the time was dentistry. So over the years, I've gotten to know dentistry really, really well. And, you know, that's kind of how it came to be. And now I'm the second generation owner. It's now McGill and Lyon Dental Advisors. And really all we do is try to help dentists uh, and specialists make smarter financial decisions as it relates to their practice. And of course, their personal side too. Interesting. So, you know, I got to tell you, we'll talk a little bit about the business side of, of the dental industry and orthodontics and, you know, current affairs and keys to moving forward. Boy, things change constantly, I'm, you know, and especially in my industry, you know, marketing is going like this. It, you know, you know who ever heard of chat GPT over a year ago? Nobody. And now it, it's, it's, if you don't know what that is, that, that's a big rock that you're under there, you know, so, um, what are some of the main trends that you're seeing now in the in the in the industry? Uh, specifically, let's talk about you know DSOs and OSOs because that's on everybody's mind. I've got a lot of of practices who couldn't be happier by taking the plunge. You know, I've got guys that have been doing this for 25, 30 years, and the fact that they don't have to worry about the headache and stuff like that, and they just you know do what they got to do and make people happy and make them smile is has been great. Um, some people say it's a nightmare. So you, what's going on now in the industry? What's the trend? And give us an update on the whole entire you know DSO OSO strategy. Absolutely. Well, first thing for everyone out there, they should know what it is to you as a dentist or practice owner. It's a transition alternative. Um, I'm not here to knock it. I know publicly I probably come out as the most negative DSO person. I'm not against DSOs. I'm just against the fact that only one side of the story got told for five or six years. And it was, you know, you can't compete with it. You better join them. You better sell now. In order to understand why you really have to live a little bit in my world where I used to come from, understand how these people get paid. 
Typically, a private equity fund is going to get paid some sort of percentage of assets under management plus a profit split. If anyone's heard of the two and 20, classic Wall Street split, 2% of assets under management, 20% of profits above a benchmark. That means these private equity funds, they get paid over how much capital is actually put to work. And there was a ton of capital over the last six, seven years. It was really cheap to come across. Lending interest rates were down. So what they were really trying to do, the private equity managers, was get paid by putting the capital to work, buying as many practices as possible. So that's been their goal. Now, their goal, and this is where I think dentists get confused, their goal was never really to make the dentists rich. That's a side effect from it. Now, as you mentioned, a lot of people 25, 30 years into practice, they love this. It's a great thing. It is a transition alternative, and it's a very, very good one. It's not for everybody, but if you're selling your practice, you're retiring, and you're not considering this, you know, what are you thinking? You need to consider it. The other side, though, what they're buying is your profit. So you're selling it to them. You're selling away five years of profit, sometimes six, sometimes seven years of profit. In exchange, you're going to work back for them at a reduced rate, four or five-ish years, it's really not a good thing for a young doctor to do strictly from a financial perspective. Um, but what you've seen happen over the last year is the money is no longer free. The money is no longer plentiful. That means a lot of the contracts that were entered to and you know promises that were made by the private equity groups to the dentist who sold aren't being fulfilled or aren't being fulfilled to the degree in which they were promised. So you're starting to hear some of the horror stories of, oh, I was promised an earnout, And an earnout is not rollover equity. An earnout is guaranteed contractual money if you reach a stated target. Some of the earnouts aren't being paid. Some of the loans can't be paid. A lot of the rollover equity is not worth what it should be. So you're starting to hear horror stories and, you know, kind of what's the truth? The truth is in between. It's a great transition alternative for some. It's not for everybody, but you need to be careful what group and who you're in bed with. Um, I find myself, I kind of chuckle forever. I was kind of bashing everyone going, hey, you need to tell both sides of the story. And now I feel like I'm the one having to come to their defenses and go, hey, just because a few of them are having trouble doesn't mean we're going to bash all of them. Some of them are run well. Some of them are great. But if you are considering this now is a time more important than ever that you're just very, very careful over who's representing you. Most of the brokers were pushing this stuff because they were getting paid by both sides of the house. The DSO would give them equity. The seller would give them a percentage of the deal. I mean, it, the whole thing was backwards for a long time. And now all of a sudden it's drying up, but it, it's really not. They're just going to be more careful about who they're buying and the sellers just need to be more careful about who they're getting in bed with. I mean, that's the same story from five, six years ago. It's just not the story that was getting told by everybody. So obviously if somebody is looking to sell a practice, they got two options. They're looking, they could either go that route or, or just sell it out to somebody and, you know, and go on to the next one and potentially, you know, con contract and work there for a year or change to, to make the transition. You know, we've got many clients here at Ortho Marketing that are younger practices that have purchased, you know, ones that have been around for 30, 40, 50 years and keeping the transition going, keeping the name out there is, is important in the, com in the community. Um, you know, what would you say if you had, if your dad was a dentist, all right, and you said that, and he was said, all right, I'm, I'm, I want to sell, okay? What would be on um, what side of the tipping point as far as selling it versus going the DSO or whistle route? It depends on everyone's situation, generally speaking, and I think you hit the nail on the head. This isn't necessarily professional financial advice, but you said if it were my dad. Right. If it were my dad, I'd tell him to sell it to a young doctor. I'd tell him not to get in bed with the private equity group. Um, now, how how you'd go about that is a little bit different. If you're a one doctor practice in the general space or most specialists, you're probably going to be able to sell outright to a new doctor. This got really, really big for the orthodontist listening, though, because an ortho practice doing three and a half, four million is worth an extraordinary amount of money that a young doctor can't pay. And this is where it gets a little tricky. 
If you play your cards right, though, what a lot of doctors are able to do to actually get more money out of the practice and transition it to an individual, which means when they run back into town, they don't have to be embarrassed in 10 years over what happened to their business. Um, A lot of them will do a partnership, meaning they'll let the young doctor buy in half of the practice and the practice will grow while that young doctor is in there. So you buy, sell the first half. It's not at the money the DSO is going to give you, but you keep the profit for that next five or seven years versus being an associate. Then when you sell them the second half of it, you get the benefit of that increased in value. So if you play your cards right, you can actually get more money by having a partnership. And like I said, I, I'm here to help people achieve their financial goals. But if it were my dad, uh, you bet I'd be sending them that route saying, hey, I think it's important that, you know, from a, your own emotional perspective that you think this through before you sell to a private equity group and that you think, hey, can we make this work with a young doctor? Say somebody's looking to, you know, to do an, an exit strategy. How do they even determine what they think the pra- a practice is worth? Is it based upon just gross billings and and as a, and a multiple? And, and is there a higher multiple selling it to a person than selling it to a private equity? That's a fantastic question. Uh, Now, it's based off earnings after doctors are paid. They throw around this term EBITDA. I think it's, you know, hey, let's, you know, make it fancy, make everyone seem like it's something new and shiny. It's not. All EBITDA is, to make it real simple, is what's the profit the owner would take away from the practice each month or each year if they hired an associate to do the work? Generally speaking, a practice will sell with a multiple of that. And that's kind of where I was telling you a very large ortho practice because orthodontists get paid on a salary, that number goes through the roof. And eventually the price to an individual is basically what the bank will lend. So even though on paper it's worth more, but this comes down to a lot of the people come to me and they have practices that do a million dollars in revenue, 1.5 million in revenue, which is a great small business. It, you know, you can have a lot of success in this business, a lot of joy in it, but they go, hey, I want to sell to a DSO and get one of these big numbers. The only way it makes sense at that level is if the overhead rate is just super, super low. And even at that point in time, it's just usually when you look at the numbers and you go, hey, I got to work back for the private equity group for five years without my profit. How much more money did they really give me than this new doctor down the road? And most of the time for most of your practices, the answer is they didn't actually give me much more money. (laughs) I would have had the same money in my pocket. I would have got to have the new doctor there and I would have been proud to walk back into town and say, hey, Dr. So-and-so is here. I'm no longer practicing. He's going to take care of you because nobody wants to have to walk into the grocery store, especially depending on where you are. If you're in a small town and you got to walk into the grocery store and some corporate group all of a sudden, you never know. Maybe they were good for two years. Then it turned over new management two years later. And all of a sudden, you know, they're drilling and filling everything and everyone's asking you about it. And you got to answer the questions. I mean, it's it's not all roses there. Right. You know, so let's, so maybe you can educate you know people who don't un- understand it from the, from the DSO or OSO side. You know, so I'd assume, and correct if I'm wrong, that they already have a lot of the stuff covered. So they're just kind of buying your revenue to a certain degree, right? So that, do they share the expenses across all multiple uh, bits of their of their of their practices? So they might so it might cost you, say, for example, hundred thousand dollars a a year in expenses or whatever. But if the DSO has got the stuff covered, it, them, their expenses might be 40 or 50. So they have a more higher margin on it because you don't have to pay each individual. They got it all covered in, in a group. So is that something that people need to know or is, or is that just my just you know, barking up a tree here? It's kind of funny the way you ask that is the DSO's goal is to buy a not so profitable practice for a lower price because they have those efficiencies, right? If a doctor has too many staff members and I buy the practice and the sales price is lower because of that additional overhead, I can go in and fire the staff members and fix the problem. But those practices aren't worth more to a DSO than they are to an individual. The ones worth more to the DSOs that you actually 
you know, the dinner party stories you hear, oh, I got this much money and you need to do it. Those are the practices that run really, really efficiently. So what the DSOs are after, and that's why I kind of started it with, you have to understand how they get compensated. They get compensated to make these deals happen. Um, I don't really know what their end game is, to be frank. I was just out speaking at a um, specialist group and a guy comes up to me and he goes, okay, so, you know, they buy up all these practices and everyone thinks they're going to exit and everybody's going to get rich. Who's going to buy them at the end of the day? And I looked at him and go, well, buddy, that's a multi-billion dollar question. I don't have the answer to, but if you just figured it out in 30 seconds, you figured out what's wrong with this whole thing. It's not to say some of them won't get bought, but I, I personally don't quite understand the end game. When this whole that whole thing started, financial multiples were through the roof. The S&P 500 traded about $33 for every $1 of earnings. And you could buy a dental practice at like $3 for every $1 of earnings, maybe $4 of every $1 of earnings. So they came in. But historically, companies go public somewhere in like the 14 to 15 times earnings range. And... I don't think the groups, everyone doing it, they were kind of in this craze and they were using these numbers of, oh, eventually we'll sell it for 20 times our EBITDA or earnings. And it's kind of money's expensive. The cost of capital for a private equity group right now, I've heard rumors is around 12%. You know, this whole thing kind of falls down when the multiples fall down. And I think you're seeing it happen. So I think in the future, what you're going to see is the ones the ones that will work will be the ones that they have these practices at these really nice overhead rates and they just generate cash flow. And somebody will come in and buy that cash flow. But overall, what they're doing, what they want, I don't know, other than making their fees, dentistry to me is just not an industry I'd want to be in as a non-dentist because you have to replace these dentists and they've overestimated the value of that founding dentist. You know, you can't just go in there and take the guy who's been in town or the girl who's been in town for 30 years, plug in a 28 year old and you've got the same practice. The whole dynamic has changed. Look, is, is there been a, a change in the way that the ownership goes? Because, you know, if like, like a, from the corporation perspective, somebody buys a, com- a company and then another company buys that company, another company buys that company. And next thing you know, it's three or four. Is that also, you know, rampant in this industry as well? So if, if somebody buy you know, sells to, you know, to a DSO, all of a sudden, a, a year later, is somebody else running it? And then a year or two later, that was sold and keep all these assets keep being sold and sold and sold to bigger, bigger conglomerates? Uh, that's exactly what you see in a lot of it. So they talk a lot and they talk about recapitalization events. And that's when they're trying to get more money. Um, a recapitalization event can happen with the same private equity firm. You can get a second private equity firm involved or what you might see is exactly that is, you know what, private equity firm X wanted to exit dentistry. So when we recapitalized, we actually got more money from private equity company Z and they bought out X. And that can happen very quickly. It's I got a quick funny one about that one. I had a, um, a dentist very aware of the situation, what could go on. I kind of told him different things that could happen. And he asked one of the guys coming in and said, hey, what happens if the money behind you changes hands? Everything you've said, what happens to that? Is it going to hold true? And to the guy's credit, he looked at him and goes, hey, if that happens, we're both in the same boat, but I can't make a promise. I can't guarantee. <laughs> and that's the cold truth. When the private equity money changes hands, you know, management can change hands. You don't know. It's not to say something bad will happen, but there's a tremendous amount of risk there. So now let's take a couple of steps backwards. So now you're, you know, guy in his 30s, 40s, woman, and they're running a, a, a practice. You know, what are the keys to being so running a, a profitable practice that you could give somebody today like two or three tips that maybe they should do they could do today to make them the, the practice more profitable tomorrow yeah well the first thing kind of relates to corporate dentistry corporate dentistry has done a great job of increasing the demand for dentistry in general so we've got more people that want dentistry that being said some of the corporate groups are great not all of them are so the first thing is do great dentistry and have a great 
customer or patient experience. If you can do those two things extremely well and make it a nine out of 10, there's a high likelihood you're going to succeed. I don't want to say it's easy, but those are the two key factors. When I look at a dental practice that's super profitable, is just how are you treating the patients? How many referrals do you get? What's that patient experience like? The second thing is um, be careful of your PPO exposures. So the orthodontists sometimes have this issue, but everyone else really has this. What you're seeing and what you're going to see is corporate expands and expands. You're seeing a demand for fee for service dentistry. So you're going to see a lot more fee for service practices. Although you will see private practice ownership go down, I think you will see the percentage of those private practices that are fee for service or close to fee for service go up. So as you design your patient experience, you put your shingle up and you know, you want to make sure that you're doing the best dentistry. You're doing that because you don't want to take insurance write-offs. Insurance write-offs keep getting worse and worse and worse. So even if you don't think it's that bad right now, go talk to a 50, 60-year-old dentist in your area that's got experience with insurance. And they'll tell you, yeah, they paid full fee in 1995. And now they pay you know, a third of my fee. Um, and then the other one, you want to make sure you plan well uh, for your own self financially. And for the sake of this podcast and limited time, I'm going to give everybody a real quick tip. And it's the rule of thirds. As a dental practice owner, roughly a third of your profit will go to taxes. Roughly a third of it you can spend. And a third of it needs to get saved. And even if you don't save into the right buckets, you don't have the right tax strategy, you can mess up a lot of things. But if you save a third of your profit, you will become financially independent. So those are my big three. If you get those three things right, I think it's going to be hard to screw up the rest. Awesome. So, you know, I'm asked all the time from practices, how much should I be spending on, on marketing? And, you know, and, and based upon the research and, and experience doing this, and according to the ADA or the AAO, it could range anywhere from 3% to 15% of gross sales. Okay. Now, depending if it's a younger practice or more experienced practice or whatever, do you have a benchmark in, in your mind that you that you think is a good barometer to use for a practice? Because you know they come to me and I give them the the proposal and you got to spend this much money and you can and and you know as an you know an accountant you, you know the most important thing is return on investment. You know, and for my eyes, marketing is by far the best investment any business can ever do. You get two, three, four hundred percent ROI if, if, if done correct. Imagine if your financial planner says, okay, give me a hundred thousand dollars. I'm going to give you 300,000 back automatically. You're like, okay, Bernie made off. Whatever you say, <laughs> you know, it's not, gonna happen. but that's the truth. How it works with marketing. So, you know, with that said, what kind of numbers should a, a average practice look at from either a dentist or ortho um, as far as how much they should be spending on marketing, because the only way to bring new patients in is to market. You have no choice. You have to compete. You know, especially if you do a search right now for you know Invisalign, in, you know, and put in your town, guarantee you're going to see um, it, people like Inv Invisalign advertising, and Candid vet advertising, and, and Spark advertising, and and you're going to see a lot of people, you know, DSOs advertising. You're going to see, you're going to see GPs advertising. You're going to see orthodontists. So you, it, your head will spin. So you have to compete. Um, so with that said, again, what what kind of numbers should a practice have in the back of their mind as far as I need to invest this much of my sales in order to to, to grow? Two to six percent is the answer. You can go as little as 1% if you are booked out way too far. But if you are at 1%, it means your practice is bigger than you want it to be. You need to be out of network. You also need to be raising fees. You know, you need to be expensive. Um, but generally speaking, most practices are going to be from 2 to 6%. It's funny. I have a ton of orthodontic practice management data and profit and loss stuff. Um, also have for GPs, but the ortho data was fascinating because ortho more than any specialty has to market. Um, it's, you know, referrals have gone down. They really go direct to consumers. So we took all of our data and sorted it and we weren't actually looking for the marketing answer. What we were trying to look for is, okay, what are all these practices operating at a above average profit margin have in common? It turns out marketing being 
higher was the common denominator. And it was because there were no empty chairs. Um, so you kind of threw out kind of, you know, anywhere from zero to 15, basically. We found six to kind of be the top um, point of it. If you were trying to dramatically grow and you had a good plan, I'd be willing to go as high as 10, but you'd want to make sure it was working. Um, what I do tell people, though, is with marketing, you know, two to six, but you need to make sure it works. Marketing's kind of like shooting a shotgun. You know, you're hoping to hit it. You don't know which pellet. So once you can find out what is working, you want to pour gasoline on that. Um, but most of the time when I see clients above 6%, it's they're doing too much in-house, which kind of, I don't think your intent was to get a self-promotion here. But basically, if I look at it, they're trying to do everything that you would do for somebody, but they're trying to do it in-house and they've got three bodies on the marketing team or something. And it's just kind of sitting there, you're looking at them going we got to outsource this. Somebody else does nothing but this. Your idea is in the right place, but you're spending 150000 to get it done. This just isn't making sense. Let's find somebody who can do this on a cost-effective basis. Um, but two to six is really your golden point. And what would you put in the marketing umbrella? Is that the salary that you're paying your TC or the, or, or the market person? Or, or is that just peripheral, you know, handling SEO ads, things like that, or is that all in? Because, you know, a typical practice that's doing a million and a half bucks, you're doing five, five percent, 45 grand, and you, you, you can't get that much that far with, 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 with a number like that, you know? Yeah, no, the TC, I really consider that sales. So we talk about marketing is marketing is going to be everything that makes the phone ring. Okay. Once the phone rings, you're in sales mode. Got it. Okay. Um, so hundred percent, you know, it's, it's tough when a practice isn't at scale. And that's why I say you might be willing to go to 10. Um, but we find a lot of it, you know, some people spend a fortune on the internet and you need to spend money on the internet. But I usually have people outsource the internet stuff. And that's going to be the majority of the cost lies in the internet stuff. But if you're marketing, especially for orthodontists, the biggest thing you can do for yourself is to get in the community. The internet kind of works in tandem with you being in the community, and they're both extremely important. If you're in the community, but you're not on the internet, nobody finds you. If you're on the internet, but you're not in the community, everyone wants to know who you are. Exactly. <laughs> so you need to do both. But the in the community stuff typically isn't nearly as expensive. It's just more about effort. And if you do things in the community, the biggest part isn't how much you spent. It's did you show up? <laughs> I remember I once, um, oftentimes we have practices that are in a mixed income community. And it's very common once you leave cities where you could have an extremely wealthy part of your clientele and you could have, you know, a Medicaid portion too. And you're dealing with both of them. So a lot of them must say, hey, well, you know, if you're an ortho, how many smiles per year do you give away? Do you donate them so they can auction it off? Or, you know, what do you do? And, you know, I asked one person, they said, oh, of course, you know, we give away four a year. And I said, well, how does it go each year when you go to the event? And they go, oh, we don't go. <laughs> I said, well, that, that wow. kind of defeats the purpose. We have to, if we're going to do it, we have to go. Um, it's not about spending a hundred thousand dollars in the community. It's about being there. Right. Exactly. Um, so I have three more questions for you, Wes. All right. Um, first is if a practice, who is the ideal customer for you? You know, so if some, so obviously a, there are quite a few dentists out there, a couple hundred thousand dentists, you know, 12,000 or so, what those in, in the U.S. So, you know, and everybody, I should be working with a consultant across the board in, in, in their expertise from financial to marketing to software, you know, that, you know, you, you went to school to learn to make teeth straighter and whiter and brighter, work with experts who know what they're, what they're doing. So, you know, ideally, why should somebody be talking to an expert like you it, you know, it, for that practice? Yeah, so we work mainly with one to three doctor owner practices. We can do larger, but I would say our bread and butter, what we do really well is one to three. Um, we help with tax planning. We help with practice management from a financial perspective. And we also make sure everybody's saving what they need to, because usually when you have problems in a partnership, especially the problems start because of money. 
And those are the three things we're really, really good at. We all, we work with people on a one-year basis, so we're not an ongoing um, part of their life. But the reason I say one to three, the more important part of that is, do we have the decision makers in the room, right? If you're going to hire us, we're going to want to make changes. We're going to save you tax money. We're going to do a lot of great things, but we're not going to have a lot of success if we don't have the decision makers or if there are 20 of them. And I will tell that, blatantly to people. I say, hey, can you help us? I said, yes, I can. But do you really think we're going to be able to wrangle all 20 of you to agree on it? Or are you just going to pay my fee and then be really upset because I gave you great advice, but nobody did it? So one to three is the bread and butter. Or sometimes we work with you know, five partner practices, but they've got a managing partner who might come to us. And the managing partner's got the authority that, hey, whatever it is we do, we're going to do. Um, but when you get into these, you know, humongous practices, there are certainly some things we can do. But generally speaking, um, it, it's going to get a little complicated and a, a little bit of frustration on trying to get some things done. Okay. All right. Next, um, two more questions. Number one is, you have the ability to have lunch with anybody that, that was ever born, fiction or nonfiction. Who are you who are you hanging out with? Oh, I'd hang out with my grandpa for sure. Nice, good, okay, cool. When when he's your age, okay. when he's yeah. eighty, or you know, what would be the, when, how far when when back in time would you go to hang out with them? You know, I hadn't really thought of that part of it. Um, he's no longer with us. He passed away when I was like 16, but I think I get my mannerisms from him. You know, he was always very soft spoken, but if something needed to be taken care of and he'd talked, you just knew that the truth was coming out of his mouth, you know, and it wasn't time to mess around. Um, I, you know, I'd, I'd probably pick about my age though. Cause I think, you know, he served in the war and came back and most of my family, I think I'm the first person to not have gone into the military, you know, they don't talk about it. It'd be fascinating to get somebody to talk about it in here. <laughs> it's, you know, I mean, have you ever seen um, Field of Dreams? I you have know? not seen that oh, one. Okay. Great scene is, you know, one of you know, Kevin Costner, you know, actually, you know, plays with the baseball with these ghosts and he ends up having to catch with his dad who's his, who's his age, you know, and it's just get tingled. If, you know, if you have had a cash with your, with your dad as a kid, every time, every time I watch that movie, I, I, you lose it, you know? So it would be great to go back and, you know, love that idea. All right. And then um, another very, very important question. Um, so the asteroid is hitting earth tonight. What's your last meal? Asteroid is hitting earth and it's my last meal. I only get to pick one, man. I love to eat. So this is a real tough one. I love, man. You can be a 14 person um, if you want. <laughs> yeah, we've got a restaurant in Charlotte that I uh, I go to a few times a year. It's very expensive. They've got a few around um, the country, but it's Steak 48. The only thing they don't have on the menu that we're definitely going to have to have is buffalo wings. Okay. So, I think from the meal perspective, I want Steak 48's food, but, you know, atmosphere, last meal, having fun. I want some buffalo wings, some cheap beer in front of a sports bar with my buddies. <laughs> there you go. Good, good deal. Excellent. Cool. All right. So, Wes, if somebody wants to get more information, contact you, what's the best way for them to do so? Yeah, it's consulting at mcgillhillgroup.com. Um, that email address will get them anything. Also, they can contact my email west.lion at mcgillhillgroup.com and then our website is just mcgillhillgroup.com so if they go on there there's a contact form um, and I always encourage everybody even if I you know I had a guy come up to me last week while I was speaking go I don't think I'm your ideal client I got about 15 partners so now you're probably not get on my calendar because I'm going to get you heading in the right direction so we're here to help we're not a pushy sales organization we just uh, my goal, and again, nothing against the private equity groups, but my goal is always, I want to be the person that supports the independent doctor. And that's, we got our foot in the sand on that one. That's where we're going to stand and where we're going to be for the next 30, 40 years. I appreciate it. So thanks so much, Wes, for joining it. So anybody who need, you know, if you are a practice, eventually you're going to need somebody like, like Wes. You have to always have a, a, an exit strategy and a plan and, you know, and especially 
better to hang out with a guy that you go and have some beer and wings with and talk about, you know, make money. So we got to love that. So Wes, thanks so much man, for joining. I really appreciate it. Everybody out in podcast land, thank you so much for, li- for listening. Thanks so much for joining us. And everybody, once again, keep smiling and make sure to go Jets. <laughs> thanks, Wes. Bye, thank everybody. you. OrthoMarketing.com, 360-degree digital marketing solutions for your practice.